This morning in the Song of Solomon, we are going to continue where we left off last week. As you can see on the screen here, we're, we've reached the honeymoon. So if you're visiting with us today and you haven't had any chance to catch up to speed with us, we're, um, we're going through God's handbook on what makes for great love, romance, and sex within the context of a Christian marriage. And again, this morning we find ourselves in chapter 4, picking up in verse 8 where we left off last week. This couple uh, here this morning in chapter 4 is uh, in what we refer to as the wedding chamber. In the culture back in that day, they would have a wedding, and then the, the bride and the groom would go off to a wedding chamber while the wedding party was still there partying and having festivities. There would be the consummation of the vows, and then the wedding couple, the new married couple, would come out and join the party, and they would all celebrate, hey, and they would continue partying perhaps for the next week. We covered that in the last, uh, well, in chapter 3 when we were dealing with the wedding. So here in chapter 4, this couple is here in the wedding chamber following the wedding vows, and as we see today in our text, they will be consummating these vows. Solomon, as we saw in the first seven verses, here we have the first six, as we saw in the first seven verses last week, has been contemplating the beauty and the character of his wife. He praised her for her virtuous character. We saw in verse 1, he'd made mention of her eyes, again, being like doves. The difference between the last time he said this is now it's behind your veil. They've been, they've been married. And he goes from there and he makes reference to her hair. Now, if you missed the... the um, the explanation of the analogy is being like a flock of goats. Men, don't use that on your wives unless you're certain that you know what you're doing because it could lead you to a lot of trouble. So he made mention of her hair. He makes mention of her teeth. He makes mention of her lips and her mouth being lovely. Her temples, her cheeks like pomegranates, she's blushing now behind her veil. He goes from there down to her neck, being like the Tower of David, resolute, a sign of trust, all the way down to verse 5 where he mentions her breast. We've just seen that Solomon has gone from her eyes down to her body, and he has said here in verse 6, as we finished somewhat last week, he's saying that he is going to, until the cool of the day when the shadows flee away, meaning all night long, he's going to be making his way to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. And we made mention of, the, of what these analogies were of the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense of being the woman's body and that he's planning on having an, an enjoyable time in the wedding chamber with his new bride. And in verse 8, we're picking up with where we left off last week. And verse 8, perhaps, is one of the most significant verses in the entire honeymoon section. Because it doesn't seem to fit. It doesn't fit the flow of progression. We've kind of this morning just kind of briefly walked through the flow of progression from eyes to teeth to mouth to lips to verse 6, I'm going to my, make my way to the mountain of myrrh, the hill of frankincense, all night long. And in verse 7, he reiterates her beauty. And then in verse 8, notice, take a look, let me show you why. Verse 8 just seems to come out of nowhere. It says in verse 8, come with me from Lebanon, my bride. May you come with me from Lebanon, journey down from the, mount, from, from the summit of Ammon, from the summit of Sinir and Hermon, from the dens of lions, from the mountains of leopards. It just doesn't flow. It's, it's a very confusing verse. Or I should say it perhaps doesn't fit our expectations, that which we were expecting from verse 6. I'm making my way to the 
hills and to the, the mountain and to the hills. It just doesn't seem to flow unless you are perhaps more connected with reality. You see that this perhaps maybe does fit real life very well, which is why I said this verse may be perhaps one of the most significant in the entirety of this section. In that verse 8 lets us know that Solomon's young bride was in no small degree mentally distracted or weighted down with insecurities and fears as he is contemplating the cool of the day when the shadows flee away. She wasn't mentally engaged yet with Solomon's desires as was described in verse 6. It seems from this verse that the Shulamite... As we're going to see right here, notice he makes mention right at the very top of verse 8. See where he says, he says, come with me from Lebanon. Perhaps, and what a lot of commentators have tended to agree on, is that perhaps the Shulamite was from Lebanon, that Lebanon was hometown for her. And we see Solomon here calling her away from a place where she perhaps is mentally distracted from, a place where she knew well, a place where all her securities were, a place where her daddy was who had been providing for her and was her stability for all of her life. And now she's in the wedding chamber with this man and she's making her life be his life. And there's some insecurities here. And we see Solomon engaging this in a very tender way indeed. Again, she's in no small degree distracted. We see again from verse 11, at the end of verse 11, corresponding with the concept that she's from Lebanon, it says, and the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. So it would be a very uh, concise thought that perhaps Solomon is dealing now with his bride. He had clear intentions, as was mentioned in verse 6, but now is having to patiently endure this period and help his new wife get to the place mentally where she is ready to give herself to him physically. So he is in verse 8 calling her away from insecurities, from her home, from other things that perhaps would be a threat. And we see at the end of verse 8 when it says, journey down from the summit of Ammon, from the summit of Sinir, and Hermon from the dens of lions and the mountains of leopards. So you got lions and leopards. It seems that the lions and the leopards here could be perhaps representing any sorts of fears that this woman has brought with her into the context of this relationship. And though we saw clearly from chapter 1, verse 2, she had a physical desire to be with this man while they were dating and in courtship. But here when the time has come and it's, it's all on the line prior to the consummation of the wedding, when everything is sealed and final, she's dealing with some mental insecurities. And this is why I made mention last week, guys. I said more to come on that later, and here we are in verse 8. So I said when you get to the, the wedding bed on your marriage night and subsequent nights after that, you do not want to rush into intimate settings like a bull in a china closet because you can perhaps and might will break something in the process, and it's a breaking of something that's in the soul of your mate. You need to deal with the insecurities and the fears. And this shoe fits on both feet. In the context of this love song, it's the bride who's dealing with some insecurities. And we see Solomon here dealing very gently and kindly with her. I can remember, and this wasn't on our honeymoon night, but I can remember probably in the first year of our marriage, my wife and I having some conversations along similar lines of chapter 4, verse 8, and we would go and we would talk about chapter 4, verse 8, because like I had mentioned to you, when I, whenever I went through the Song of Solomon for the first time, I just decided that this was the only book I was going to use to give me marriage counseling. And so I, and what I discovered was that my, my young bride, she had some securities that were linked with family, that were linked with her father and the security that father provided for her for her entire life. I was just getting started. And might I say I was a little bit more scattered than was, than was her stable father who had for multiple years been walking with Jesus. I had only been walking with Jesus for a few and so I would just try to reassure those fears in her that I'm going to do everything I can 
to provide for you and to, to care for you and to remove any sense of concerns that you may have with regard to me as being your husband and being the leader of a family and the leader of a home. So these kinds of insecurities uh, are there. I, I, now, I'm not certain if this is scientifically supported or not. But I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm fairly certain that most women, and again, there's always exceptions to every rule, so um, perhaps this isn't a sh the one size fits all. But it would seem to me, I'm fairly certain, that most, and I'll say most women, have something called a security gland in their body, if that makes sense, because they seem to have all kinds of glands and, um, and, and such. And so I think there's one that was, that's there called a security gland. And it speaks to them in their inner ear, that security gland does. And it tells them things, and it can sometimes leave them feeling a bit insecure at times. And sometimes, sometimes, as we see here in verse 8, even during times when one might least expect it. Now, I'm, again, I'm not speaking from personal knowledge. I've only heard this from others hypothetically, that this might be true. I, just putting it out there, but it's clear from verse 8 that Solomon is working to get his bride on the same honeymoon train that he clearly was on in verse 6 and verse 7. Until the cool of the day when the shadows flee away, I will make my way to the mountains of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. Notice the patience here in verse 8 with which Solomon makes such progress. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. May you come with me from Lebanon. Journey down from the summit of Ammon, from the summit of Sinir and Hermon, from the dens of lions, from the mountains of leopards. He takes the time to stop and to deal with matters of the heart. I believe herein lies the secret to every great love song. Verse 8. Great lovers are patient and selfless, always looking out for the needs of their true love, prioritizing matters of the heart. Amen? Amen. Men, Solomon's patient shepherding of his bride needs to be an example to us all. Well, to no one's surprise, from verses 9 through 11, we see that she has gathered her thoughts. Notice verse 9 and following. He says, now in verse 9, he says, You have made my heart beat faster, my sister, my bride. You have made my heart beat faster with a single glance of your eyes, with a single strand of your necklace. We can clearly see the intensity of, the, of this moment picking up. Twice he mentions that his wife has made his heart beat faster with the glance of her eyes and with the strand of her necklace. And as has been mentioned before, think about this, the eyes are the portal to one's soul, right? I mean, you can see sadness in someone's eyes, can you not? You can see happiness in a person's eyes. You can see when a person is concerned when you look into their eyes. You can see fear in someone's eyes when you look into their eyes. You can see commitment. There's all kinds of nonverbal communication that eyes can and do always speak. And it makes good sense here, and it seems that he is seeing something in her eyes that communicates to him that she has forgotten about the issues of verse 8 and is letting him know that she is now desiring him intimately. And as a result of that, it says clearly, his heart beats faster with the glance of her eyes. His heart rate has improved. And wives, this is really something very important that you need to know. Listen, there is a look that says, could you just hurry up and get this over with? And then there's this kind of look right here. And there's a 
massive difference between the two. And you need to remember, all of us, that sexual intimacy, while physically great, there's a lot of this verbal, nonverbal communication that's going on that impacts the soul of your husband and or of your wife. And this kind of look, the kind of look we see here with the glance of your eyes, my heart rate has increased, you can ask any man, is the kind of look that leaves a man knowing that his wife is wholly acceptable and desirable of him. And at a soul level, he feels this and knows this. It's way, it's way deeper than just the physical intimacy and enjoyment that comes therein. Way deeper than that. Remember, human lovemaking isn't just two slugs on a leaf doing a physical act for the purpose of, pro, of, uh, pro, of propagating their species. They are two living souls made in the image of God, joined together as one flesh for the unique opportunity of complementing each other, both as lovers and as those who are in love. And it's both amazing and true, but with... The single glance of your eyes, wife, you can communicate and accomplish both of these for your husband. Simply put, be all there, wives. Be all there. Properly deal with all the mental distractions. Husbands, be patient while you need to help in that process. But be all there. Verse 10, how beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine, and the fragrance of your oils than all kinds of spices. Your lips, my bride, drip honey. Honey and milk are under your tongue, and the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. Now, a simple question is, how does he know that there is milk and honey under her tongue? Well, I'm going to go with the thought that they are pretty heavily involved at this point in what we called Hebrew kissing, which if you remember from, remember from chapter 1, verse 2, whenever she said, may he kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, uh, we indicated that Hebrew kissing predated French kissing perhaps by several thousand years. And we see here clearly that she has responded to her man, and he's saying that her love is much better than the intoxication of wine. And did you notice the play of, on words at the end of verse 11 here? Again, bringing back the context of Lebanon, he says, And the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. Remember in verse 8, where was he calling her away from? He was calling her away from Lebanon. He said, come with me from Lebanon, my bride. May you come with me from Lebanon. He's calling her away from Lebanon. Lebanon, if you will, is where? It's in the past. Lebanon is gone so by saying that the fragrance of her garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon seems poetically to be indicating, as does the context in which this fits, that like Lebanon, her garments are now too a thing of the past. That too is a sort of distraction that has now been fully removed. Meaning that the progression of their intimacy now has them tr truly ready for the consummation of their vows. And right on cue, as if this book were indeed a love song, we see in verses 12 through 15, Solomon, as he mentioned in verse 6, now making his way to the hill of frankincense and liking it, likening it to a garden that has been locked up, that nobody has ever entered and expresses his joy and excitement of being the one who now gets to enter into his garden. Notice verse 12. He says, a garden locked is my sister, my bride, a rock garden locked, a spring sealed up. The Shulamite clearly has kept herself a virgin until it was time to awaken her love, and Solomon here is recognizing this. A garden locked is my sister, my bride, but not just a garden locked, a rock garden locked. 
if you can imagine, a, a double fortress. It's not just locked. There's, it's a rock garden that's locked, and he also says a, a spring that is sealed up. They did not arouse or awaken love until after the wedding vows, as we saw on two different occasions, was the refrain within the love song. They would show desires of intimacy one with another, and it was always followed with the refrain, but do not arouse or awaken love until it pleases. And here we see the arousal and the awakening of love after the wedding vows and the affirmation that they have done this God's way. She is a spring sealed up. He did not violate another man's spring. He did not violate the, the virginity of his young bride prior to making vows of commitment until death would part them. And so he goes on in verse 13 and he says, Your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with choice fruits, henna with nard plants, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, along with all the finest spices, you are a garden spring, a well of fresh water, and streams flowing from Lebanon. Suffice it to say that Solomon, in the description here, is perhaps, you might say, a very happy man. Because it's the right time. And he waited. There's no more need for postponement of arousal. It's the time for the awakening of love. He says that she is a garden spring, a well of fresh water. And she says in verse 16, just notice verse 16, the very first word in verse 16. And here for the first time we have the Shulamites speaking again in the love song um, since before the wedding. Remember in chapter Three, the wedding was all about Solomon. In chapter 4, so far it's been about Solomon and Solomon's description of his bride and her beauty, etc. And here we have for the first time her speaking. And the first word she makes mention of in verse 16 at this moment is awake. Awake, O north wind, and come, wind of the south. Make my garden breathe out fragrance. Let its spices be wafted abroad. May my beloved come into his garden and eat its choice fruits. Now, I don't think that this requires a whole lot of commentary. How about you? She's saying, Solomon, dear husband, here I am. Come and get me. May my beloved come into his garden. It's no longer her garden, but his garden. And as we see in chapter 5, verse 1, Solomon does exactly that. In 5, 1, Solomon says, I have come into my garden. And notice the past tense language here of all of this. I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride, I have gathered my myrrh along with my balsam. I have eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. Four times he says, I have, I have, I have, I have. Solomon and the Shulamite have consummated their wedding vows. The two became one flesh. And again, what I began with last week, with the honeymoon, we end here now in chapter 5, verse 1, the very end of chapter 5, verse 1. Notice we have a new voice speaking into the love song. It's clear from the context that this is neither the voice of Solomon, this is neither the voice of the Shulamite. And most of the commentaries that I've read on this agree that this is indeed an insertion from God Himself speaking into the love song following the consummation of. The marriage vows, and God in essence is saying and does say, eat, friends, drink and imbibe deeply, O lovers. God's affirmation and endorsement of the imbibement of marital love. Sex in the context of marriage as defined by God's word of one man and one woman is that which is to be greatly enjoyed. 
Yes, it will produce offspring, absolutely. But clearly in this love song, we see that it was for the enjoyment of both husband and wife. Eat, friends, drink and imbibe deeply, O lovers. Imbibe on the pleasures of marital love. The, the ESV says to be drunk on love, intoxicated with marital love, and the enjoyment and the pleasures that come from sharing love with the one you love most deeply. Be intoxicated with marital love. So if you're married here this morning, I would say be ye not merely hearers of the word, but be effectual doers of the word and imbibe deeply on marital love. Your marriage, as I made mention in chapter 3 specifically, as Paul makes mention as a mystery in the New Testament of the love of Christ, the groom with his church, the bride. And in your marital relationship, you were putting on display for a world to see the love of God for his people. As a husband loves his wife, as Christ loves the church. And as a wife submits to her husband, as the church submits to Christ. Paul said it's a deep mystery. In the Song of Solomon, we're seeing some of the unveiling of that mystery. And it takes us all the way back to the, to the Genesis creation mandate. When it says it's for this reason, and Paul uses this in Ephesians, it's for this reason that a man will leave his father and his mother and will take a wife unto himself and the two become one flesh. It's a, there's a permanency. In God's eyes, it's never to be ended. We saw 1 Corinthians 7 last week, but we didn't start at the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Matter of fact, this bond is so intimate and it's so true it says that if you divorce if a husband or a wife were to divorce one another without a biblical cause and there's only two mentioned in the scriptures that you are to remain single the rest of your life until that mate dies in conjunction with the vows that you made before god the father son and holy spirit now these are getting violated all over the place and all the time but it doesn't make it right god through the Song of Solomon, is showing husband and wife and all of us the beauty and the intimacy there is to be between a man and his wife. Paul says there's a mystery with that, with Christ and his church. So allow your relationship, husband and wives, be that which is reflecting of the love of God. Because you will have people watching you. Husbands, you will have people watching you and how you treat your wife. And wives, how you treat and respect and submit to your husbands. People are watching these things. And it can make a significant difference for the church gathered. When the body is gathered and they see, young people see. We have young people here this morning. We have younger people out here. When the young people see husbands and wives doing it right, they desire to have that. And that's what we want. We want to extol the beauties of marital bliss. And in no greater place do we see this than in the Song of Solomon. Now, I discovered this in my reading of commentaries. I didn't discover this on my own. But interestingly, if you go from chapter 1, verse 2, in the Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 2, so you got 1-1, one, one, which is the opening, which is the Song of Songs, which is Solomon. So if you, he kind of pushed that one off, and he began in, in verse 1, chapter 1, verse 2, may... He kissed me with the kisses of his mouth. If you go from chapter 1, verse 2, all the way over to chapter 4, verse 15. There's 111 lines of poetry or stanzas. And then if you go from chapter 5, verse 2, all the way to the end of the Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 14, you have 111 lines. In the very center, in the heart of this love song, where she speaks awake, where he says, I have come, and God says, imbibe deeply, O lovers. You have the core, you have the center of the love song. So to assume that marital intimacy is something that, needs, that can be played with is a, is a misunderstanding of gargantuan proportion. And this is why husband and wife must protect the wedding bed at all cost. 
and nothing must be allowed in there. Zero pornography, zero, needs to be allowed in there. It's an intimacy between one man and one woman. It's at the core of the beauty of God's design for husband and wife. When I marry couples, I say to them, usually at the very beginning, Matt Kerr might remember this, I said that when a couple gets married, a pastor is sending them out on a journey that could be one of the most destructive journeys they ever experience in their entire lifetime. Or it could be one of the most God-blessed institutions that they've ever experienced in their lifetime. And our submissiveness to God and His Word is what makes all the difference. So I don't know where you stand this morning, where you're at in your relationships, where things are at, but my plea to each of you who are married this morning, if there's a need for repentance, repent and get back to living by faith and do it God's way. Read through the Song of Solomon. See the simple, these are simple precepts that are laid out for how to make love, romance, and sex work beautifully according to God's word. Stop doubting God's word in the darkness when you see in the clear day of light the, 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 the aspects of it. And, and, and I, I challenge you, taste and see that God's ways are good. His word has stood the test of every speculative philosophy out there, and it will stand the test of time. Yea, it will endure forever. Do it God's way. Amen? Marital intimacy and sexuality are sacred. Sacred. Between one man and one woman. A husband, a wife. So I'm going to say it again. Be not merely hearers of the word, but effectual doers. Eat, friends. Drink and imbibe deeply, O oh lovers. And if you're single, not yet. But this is the glories of waiting and doing it right. Not yet. Do not arouse or awaken love until it's pleasing to God. And you make your vows and you commit to each other till death parts you. Do it God's way. You'll never regret it. I promise. Let's pray.